Um, and thanks for the invitation to speak. I think this is going to be fun. Um, so the the story I'm going to tell you today is um, it travels through a couple of different papers, and it kind of began about a decade ago. And so um, um, before I want to before I begin talking, I want to just acknowledge that there's a lot of different collaborators and co-authors who contributed to me to put onto a slide. So um, I'll just um, focus on uh, some of the the key collaborations. Um, starting with um, my colleagues uh, in the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology and also in chemistry at uh, University of Hawaii at Manoa. Uh, and then also we've um, been, been doing a lot of work with the Center for Integrated Nanotechnologies at Sandia National Lab and also co-shared co, co with the Los Alamos National Lab, the Molecular Foundry, um, um, where I'm working right now, and the Advanced Light Source um, at Lawrence Berkeley Lab, and then uh, my collaborators at Washington University at St. Louis, University of Glasgow, and Curtin University, um, in addition to others. And then in terms of funding, this work's been funded for more than a decade by NASA, and then recently NSF is also um, funding some aspects of it. So, whoops, I'm pushing the wrong button. Uh, hold on a second. Ah, got it. Okay. <laughs> so I want to start by um, describing space weathering, um, which Alex just summarized um, for us. Oh, sorry, Professor Rizika. <laughs> and then I'm going to explain uh, why comet dust in particular is useful for, uh, for studying space weathering. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about our samples and methods in broad brush strokes, and uh, I'll show how we uh, demonstrated that we have um, radiolytic water generation. That means um, water being formed by, in this case, solar wind radiation in silicates, both in comet dust and then also in, um, in laboratory irradiated standards. And, and then um, the second project involves adding energy into the system um, to simulate the effect of, of impacts um, occurring in these, um, these space environments. And then finally, I'll talk about um, asteroid regolith. So regolith is just the term for dirt on asteroids because it doesn't have as much um, organic um, components being brought in from, from organisms, of course. Um, and so these are from sample return missions. Um, fortunately, I can talk to you now about um, some results from Itokawa. We were under a, a, a press embargo, but it's just been published. So I'm going to talk to you about um, Itokawa um, asteroid samples, and then I'll, I'll just mention Ryugu and Bennu. These are another uh, additional um, asteroid uh, sample returns that are that are here and, and coming. And then I'll wrap up with some implications. And if there's time, I'll talk a little bit about um, next, next explorations. So um, space weathering is a term that encompasses um, all of the processes that alter the surface of materials in space. And it's important to understand because um, when you alter the surface, of course, you also alter the optical properties, like how they look when you look at them through a telescope. And um, so if we can understand how space weathering is affecting um, the, the materials out in space, we have a better way of interpreting um, the solar system bodies that are around us because unfortunately we can't physically go visit and collect samples from all of them, although we're, we're trying to do as many as we can. Um, so uh, one cause of space weathering is our own sun um, because stars basically act like big old implantation sources. Um, our sun is losing about 10 to the minus 14 solar masses per year. So. 10 to the minus 14 of its own mass. Um, some other stars can lose nine orders of magnitude more mass per year. Um, we, uh, we know the composition that the, that of the material that the sun is spitting out um, from a variety of, of sources, but basically that solar wind is made up almost entirely of hydrogen. Um, so protons, right, hydrogen ions. And um, then there's another small percentage that's helium ions and the remaining 0.1% is the entire rest of the periodic table. This is by number as opposed to by mass. So those ions and neutrals that are being ejected from the sun um, when they go and hit a, an airless body like an asteroid um, or a comet, they then alter the chemistry and the structure of that material. And then there's also um, solar flares um, where lar large amounts of material are spat out um, in the sun, and those can release high energy ions that actually will pass through crystals and create little damage tracks. Like they will create a little, a little path that's been amorphized through, through a crystal in the sample. 
And um, we can actually correlate the density of those tracks, they're called solar flare tracks. We can correlate them to the amount of time that that object's been exposed to the sun. Um, and fortunately, we actually have that correlation at one astronomical unit, like the Earth-Sun distance, thanks to the return of the Lunar Surveyor 3 camera from the moon. And so we, we have an idea of what kind of solar flare track density corresponds to what exposure time. So um, even prior to the Apollo missions to the moon, um, it was predicted that solar wind should alter the, the surface properties of the moon since the moon um, doesn't really have much of a productive magnetic uh, field or atmosphere, right? Um, and then when the lunar samples came back, oh yes, that's working now, okay. When the lunar sam samples came back, um, what researchers found is that there actually are two basic underlying processes that are contributing to the space weathering patina that forms on the surfaces of these rocks. One is impacts by micrometeorites. If the moon is a big body, it's got a lot of gravity, um, so it's pulling rocks to itself. And then the other is this radiation by the solar wind, by these by ions. Um, this schematic on the right-hand side, uh, do I have a mouse? I do. The schematic on the right-hand side kind of gives you an idea of um, the, all the different processes that, that are occurring. And um, so they include uh, vaporization and deposition, physical and thermal shock, um, amorphization, sputtering. Um, and so you can see it's really complicated and being able to un unravel all of this is not necessarily so simple. It makes studying lunar space weathering really interesting, but it can be useful to look at a simpler case. And so this is where comet dust can be really helpful. Um, comets are small icy bodies that formed really far from the sun and they've, they've stayed frozen until they, until they happen to get into an orbit that takes them near the sun. But that means that when, um, when their dust is released, um, it hasn't experienced aqueous processing at all. And so it then is basically only getting the solar wind irradiation portion of the space weathering processes. So it's a simplified form of space weathering. Okay, so um, comet dust is actually falls nicely into my particular niche of research. Um, I study fine grain materials um, from extraterrestrial bodies and um, that the fact that comet dust has been um, preserved in a frozen state um, for, you know, since, since its release makes it a, a great repository for preserved materials from the beginning of the solar system. So how do we go find ourselves some comet dust to study, right? <laughs> I just said it's a good idea, but where do we get it from? Um, well, as I said, um, when a comet, uh, when, when an icy body gets close enough to the sun um, to start having those ices sublime away, then that releases dust. And so comets that, as you guys are familiar with them, will have a, a dust tail and an ion tail. And that dust tail is great because um, it lingers around after the comet passes. And fortunately for us, the Earth will pass through um, some of these uh, dust tails left, left behind by comets. And so we can actually collect comet dust here on Earth. And in fact, um, NASA has been uh, collecting um, dust high in the stratosphere with high altitude aircraft for um, more than four decades now, or well about four decades now. Um, so this is an, an example of um, these very long winged aircraft that um, can have enough lift to, to fly at around 60,000 feet. Um, in addition, uh, comet dust is collected in from um, polar snow and ice. So those um, you would collect um, snow and ice and melt it to collect um, comet dust. And then um, more recently, we've been collecting um, dust with, a, with an, um, an air sampler. So basically pulling it directly from the air on Mauna Loa, where we take advantage of the fact that at nighttime, catabatic winds um, actually pull the, the troposphere down over the top of the mountain. And so we get much cleaner air than um, would be in the boundary layer that we, we live and breathe in all the time. So again, the point of this, all of this is to try to collect the dust before it gets intermixed with terrestrial dust, right? That makes it a lot harder to pick out uh, uh, extraterrestrial dust. And then finally, um, we actually have uh, some space missions that are going to these bodies and getting dust and bringing it back to Earth. And so in 2006, uh, NASA's Stardust mission returned um, dust from Comet 81 p 2 And um, I'm going to talk a little bit later about 
some additional missions that brought back dust from, from asteroids or that are in the process of doing so. Oops. Okay. Okay, so um, what does this dust look like? So if we pull out one of those dust particles from, from a comet dust stream, um, this is what you might see. Um, this is an SEM image on the lower left. Um, the, the scale bar is one micron. Or, let's see, so for scale, um, a typical human hair is on the order of 100 microns across. And then um, this is a thin slice that was cut from that same particle using what's called an ultramicrotome. It's essentially a, a, a thin diamond blade that's used um, to, to slice materials that are low enough density that they cut nicely by that method. And then we can actually look at that in the TEM. And this is a, um, a high angle annular dark field image from a region of this um, common dust particle. So this slice, um, um, this particular slice is about 50 nanometers thick. Um, so it has to be thin enough for the electrons to be able to pass all the way through it. That's, that's the, the basis for transmission electron microscopy. And um, you can see that um, it's pretty complex at the nanometer scale. And if you go to even higher magnification, we can even find metal grains that are just a few nanometers across. Um, this is a multi-element map that was produced from energy dispersive X-ray fluorescence spectroscopy, um, again in a TEM. And um, so this just shows the, the high chemical heterogeneity um, that's consistent with a, a primitive unequilibrated materials. And the thing I wanted you to note now that's gonna come back at the end of my talk is that it's not just rocks that are present here. There's a lot of um, carbon, there's a lot of organics um, and the, the, the rock, rocky matter and the organic matter is, um, is intimately mixed. So kind of keep that in your back of your mind for later. And then the second point is that small particles, um, dust is great for looking at space weathering because it has a high surface to volume ratio. So it's, a, it's good, to, good for looking for space weathering effects. Okay, so what, um, how do we, well, first of all, how do you know, how do you know that that dust particle is from outer space hope? <laughs> Um, the, the evidence is actually here that this, these particles have had residents, have spent time in outer space. And it's in the form of um, solar wind amorphous rims um, on the surfaces. So this amorphized rim on the surface was, um, was amorphized by, by protons and helium ions from the solar wind, and then solar flare tracks. So you can see these, um, these linear features in this olivine crystal are, as I was telling you, this amorphous trail left by a, by a higher energy ion. Um, you, can't, uh, you can't do that on Earth because um, Earth's magnetic field basically excludes a solar wind. So um, you wouldn't find these features in something that was terrestrial. And then um, based on the solar flare track density, um, we can estimate that the cometary type uh, of interplanetary dust particles, so they've traveled between planets to get to us, they typically have spent between um, 10 and 100,000 years in the inner solar system before um, they're finally reaching an earth crossing orbit. Okay, too much extra information. All right, so this brings us to a really interesting question. Um, and, and that is, can we, can these solar wind protons, this hydrogen ions, react with oxygen in rocks to make water? Right, we're slamming um, protons into oxygen-bearing rocks. Can can the hydrogen and the oxygen react and and form either bound water as as hydroxyl OH or um, unbound water as H two O? And I'm um, sorry, I'm in a bad spot <laughs> for the sun. Let me slide over a bit here. So um, we do, we do detect water on the moon. The three micron water absorption band um, is seen both using remote um, infrared spectrometers and also orbiting spectrometers. Oh, I'm sorry, my apologies. <clears throat> and then, um, and I should say that, that uh, the amount of water that's detected then fluctuates with the lunar day. And um, then water ice has also been observed in permanently shadowed craters using um, radar and neutron spectrometry. And then LCROSS, the, the Lunar Crater Observation and Sensing Satellite, actually made its own new crater in the moon and, um, and showed that there was water ice present. So <clears throat> there's water there. Um, the possible origins for water on the moon are water that was 
primordial that was basically um, incorporated into the moon when it formed and it somehow is working its way to the surface through geologic processes. Uh, water delivered by um, water rich comets and asteroids during the late heavy bombardment. This is very likely, right, what formed all the craters on the moon. And then finally, this, this um, possibility that you can actually form water from the solar wind. Um, so of course, there's been a lot of experiments to produce and detect this radiolytic water. Um, this has led to more than 40 years of debate, um, largely due to the technical challenge of being able to detect very small amounts of water you know, at the surfaces of essentially bulk samples. And so this was kind of the state of the state of play when we started looking at the, this problem about a decade ago and, and began applying transmission electron microscopy and in-situ detection methods um, to look for water. And so I'm gonna walk through um, a series of papers um, uh, in this field and, and hopefully you'll, um, you'll enjoy seeing this, <laughs> this progress as well. Pardon me. I think it's picky about what button I push. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so um, first, uh, just a rough overview of samples and methods. Um, so the results I'm gonna talk about is work that was done at multiple institutions um, on multiple instruments um, with a lot of different collaborators. So again, just very broad. So our samples include mineral standards and water. So those are, those are standards we're using. And then cometary interplan interplanetary dust particles um, and asteroid regolith. And then key sample prep methods are um, laboratory ion irradiations in order to be able to simulate the solar wind. Um, and of course, then we're using um, protons or hydrogen ions, um, deuterium ions and helium ions. Um, deuterium um, as an isotopically labeled proton. So a way for us to distinguish from, um, from hydrogen that might be coming from basically from terrestrial sources. And then we're using energies um, uh, consistent with the solar wind. Um, then we were making samples to be able to do a TEM and also atom probe tomography using um, focused ion beam methods. So we're using a, a, a beam of ions to basically extract a thin slice of the sample and then remove the damaged layer. Um, and we use that for the, the, the consolidated rocks. So the standards and also asteroid regolith. For um, more fluffy porous material like the cometary dust, um, samples, we can actually use this ultramicrotomy diamond slicing method. Um, our key analytical methods are, um, are transmission electron microscopy or scanning transmission electron microscopy for imaging, um, for energy dispersive X-ray fluorescence, which gives us um, elemental chemistry, and for electron energy loss spectroscopy, which I'll, I'll talk about some more. Um, then we also use in-situ quadrupole mass spec um, and atom probe tomography. I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about the, the TEM because, again, that's my that's my, um, my field, <laughs> and particularly electron energy loss spectroscopy, since this is key to, um, to our first um, big results. So we, um, we carried out imaging and also um, the, the, the two spectroscopies, so X-ray spectroscopy and electron energy loss spectroscopy with um, a Titan a TEM. Um, at the University of Hawaii. We um, are using a, a, an analogous, a very similar instrument um, at the molecular foundry as well. And so these instruments have a monochromator at the top of the microscope. Um, you can see the person for scale. So it's, it's a pretty tall instrument. <laughs> so all the way up at the top is this monochromator. And, and what this does is it selects out a narrower bandwidth of energies um, for the electrons that then pass through the sample and interact with it. And this allows us to get good energy resolution at the bottom when, when we're actually doing um, energy spectroscopy. Um, it also has two spherical aberration correctors. One is used in um, conventional TEM mode, and then the other one is used um, in, a, in a focused probe mode where you basically focus the electrons into a, into a little um, point and raster it across the sample. So we have these two different imaging modes. And then at the bottom is a, is a high resolution spectrometer. Um, this is basically, so after the electrons pass through the sample, they interact with the sample and they, they lose some energy in, in that interaction. So we have like a range of electron energies coming out after your sample and you pass it through a bend magnet and those different energy electrons will take different radiuses of cur curvature through the, through that magnetic field. And so at the other end, you basically, you get a, a spectrum of, um, how much energy those electrons lost in, um, in going through 
the sample as a function of their energy. And so this is the, the basis for electron energy loss spectroscopy. Um, the combination of the monochromator and the high resolution spectrometer lets us basically do low dose imaging. So not damage our samples very much. And then also this, this again, this high energy spectroscopy. Um, and this is maybe a little hyper-technical, but the, the point here is that um, with the monochromator, you can get um, uh, 100 milli electron volt energy resolution. With a sample in the beam, it's more like 120 to 160. And then um, this, the low loss region, so this low energy region with um, where, where the electrons aren't losing much energy um, between around five and 30 EV or so, um, it's really useful for looking for signs of water and also where it's also where you would see um, hydrogen and helium for solar wind. Okay, so let's get into the meat now. So these are those are basically the kinds of tools that we're using to try to study um, water generation and silicates. And um, in fact, it, like a lot of science, um, it was actually a bit of a happy accident <laughs> that we stumbled on. Um, on water because we started out looking for solar wind implanted helium, um, knowing that we should see um, helium peaks around 23 or 24 EV in, in our en electron energy loss spectroscopy. And um, this is a, an enormous helium peak. This is actually from a, a laboratory rated standard. Um, so although in retrospect, we should have been expecting water, we really, really weren't expecting water because um, the cometary type of, of extraterrestrial dust has completely anhydrous mineralogy. It's, it's completely un, un, unequilibrated and anhydrous. And then when we used infrared microspectroscopy at the synchrotrons, we couldn't see any evidence for, um, for water. Um, now, again, this is one of these techniques that's effectively looking at the bulk of the sample, um, partly because it's diffraction limited. Um, and so we're sort of trying to find a very, very, very small signal in a large, <laughs> in a bulk sample, it's your, your chances of success are not so great. Um, so anyway, so I'm going to talk now about um, work that's um, in this Bradley et al. paper. It was published in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in, in 2014. And I'm going to start by showing you the standards so that you can see what features we were looking for. Um, we use two standards for water. One is water, <laughs> um, and that water is put into a liquid cell. So this basically is a cell that has two electron transparent windows on it that lets you um, put a liquid in between without having it completely evaporate in the vacuum of the electron microscope. And then the second standard is um, the mineral talc, which is convenient because it um, happily decomposes to um, MgSiO2, excuse me, MgSiO3, SiO2, and water um, when you when you radiate it with electrons. Sorry, I'm rotating to try to keep the sun off me. I'm in a bad room. I should have picked a different spot. So on the right hand side are our um, our results from our standards. Um, at the very top is just the empty cell, the empty liquid cell, and all we see here is a volume plasmon from basically from the windows in the in the cell. And then below that are two spectra from with water in the cell. Um, in one, we can see a feature at about eight and a half EV that corresponds to the energy gap for, for water. Um, in another instance, we can actually see the hydrogen K edge and, and, and a feature at around um, four EV that corresponds to an ionization threshold for water. Um, for talc at low beam currents, um, we just see maybe a hint of this energy gap feature. And as the, um, the beam current was increased, um, when we get to high beam currents, we, we start to see, again, this hydrogen K edge feature. And by that point, we're actually um, able to observe bubbling. <laughs> like in the imaging, we can see bubbling happening in the talc sample. So we, we know that we're decomposing it at that point and, and driving, off, um, driving off water. So now that we kind of know what water looks like in the TEM, um, we can start looking at our cometary type of dust. And you'll recall that I, I, I described this amorphized rim on the surface of space weathered um, silicates. In this case, this is olivine. Um, so within those amorphous rims are little vesicles, little bubbles. And this is a blow up of a amorphous rim, not actually the same particle, but you can see a vesicle here, for example. So what we did was we took eel spectra um, on the crystalline substrate in the amorphous rim 
like not on a vesicle. And then we looked for vesicles that were still sealed. So they still, they weren't, they weren't um, cut open in the process of making the thin section. And doing that, um, we have some spectra here. So um, on the top is a low loss electron energy loss spectrum from a vesicle that's still sealed in an amorphous rim in our comet, cometary type inter interplanetary dust particle. And we see all three of those water features. We see the hydrogen K edge, the energy gap, and the ionization threshold. This is a second spectrum from that same location. And then eventually, uh, we actually poked a hole in the vesicle. And so after the vesicle was perforated, um, all that water went out into the vacuum of the, the TEM system. And this is what we see after that. We lose all of those water features. They, they disappear. Um, below that is a spectrum um, from the amorphous room next to the vesicle, and we see some hints of the water features. And then the pyroxene substrate is, is lacking any of those features, but there's a few um, uh, uh, low intensity, some weak uh, surface plasmons on the, on the bulk plasma. So the fact that the water features uh, disappear with perforation of the vesicle is strongly suggests that that's unbound water coming off, right? But it's not entirely clear whether that water was initially bound or unbound, whether it was basically driven off um, or um, converted into, into unbound by the electron beam. Um, I would just point out that the water features um, weren't really observed in the talc sample until um, we were at an electron beam current sufficiently high that it was actually definitely decomposing, like developing bubbles, bubbling. So we, we think that it's that we were actually looking at unbound water. Okay, oops, wrong way. Okay, so of course, um, anytime you see water in an extraterrestrial sample, you have to ask yourself whether you're just seeing uh, contamination by terrestrial water. And so we needed to go into the lab and um, and basically demonstrate that that protons like solar wind protons were making this water and it wasn't somehow a contamination effect so we um we irradiated two sets of um, silicate mineral standards um, one was irradiated with protons hydrogen ions and one with helium ions um, again at solar wind type energies and then we we made little thin slices of those electron transparent slices and put them in our tem and so on the top is the um is the the section from the helium irradiated sample. And the, the, it has this amorphous rim with some vesicles in it. The bottom is the hydrogen irradiated sample, proton irradiated sample. Um, the helium irradiated sample shows the helium K edge. That's great. And a couple of um, surface plasmons. Um, the substrate um, under, underneath it is just below it. And then on the bottom, the proton irradiated sample, we see our three water features pop up here. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So the fact that we are seeing the water features in a proton irradiated mineral standard, but not in a, in a helium ion irradiated mineral standard, um, lets us conclude that solar wind protons are making water in um, silicate mineral surfaces. So that was our conclusion there. And then um, we went ahead to do a, a follow-on project where we um, added energy into our proton irradiated silicates. And so the, the idea here is that um, cometary type interplanetary dust, um, when it's captured um, you know, by the Earth orbiting <laughs> through a, through a, um, a dust stream, um, it experiences pulse heating because that dust is basically getting frictionally heated as it passes through the Earth's atmosphere. And um, the, that pulse heating is estimated to be up to temperatures of 900 Kelvin. The moon surface also experiences heating um, with the, the lunar day up to about 400 Kelvin or so. And then on the moon, there's also this more complex style of space weathering where you have irradiation, but you also have impacts. And those impacts are basically adding in thermal shocks, right? Adding, adding energy into the system as well. Um, prior irradiation studies, including ours, did not do a great job of controlling the substrate temperature. And so um, in this new experiment, what we did was we, um, we did a really good job of when we did the irradiation, we, we kept the substrate at very low temperature at 10 Kelvin, but we also um, irradiated with um, deuterium. And so deuterium acts like hydrogen, right? It's, a, it's an isotope of hydrogen, basically. Um, but it's isotopically, because it's isotopically distinct, if you see, if you're looking at deuterium, you know that you put it in there, that it wasn't just... Um, 
an adventitious contaminant that, that happened to get into your system somehow. So there were two um, experiments. One involved after irradiating olivine, um, the silicate olivine with deuterium ions, um, the sample was then put through this thermal desorption cycle, basically heated up from 10 Kelvin up to 300 Kelvin. Um, and during that whole process, it's being um, observed by the, an in-situ residual gas analyzer to see what's coming off the surface. The second experiment, the sample was irradiated with deuterium. Um, and then it was actually um, exposed to a pulsed infrared laser um, that essentially acts like like, micro, like micrometeorite impacts on the surface. So like you're smacking it and raises the temperature up in the range of 1400 Kelvin, similar to what you would experience with, um, with micrometeorite impacts. And then the sample was also thermally desorbed. So it was heated. And same thing, um, this was observed with an in-situ residual gas analyzer to see what was coming off. And then after that, we actually looked at the samples with TEM as well. So this, these results were described in a 2019 um, PNAS paper by Zhu et al. And what we found was, um, if we, if we, um, well, first of all, if the sample wasn't irradiated at all, we didn't see anything. We didn't see any deuterium. <laughs> that's a good, that's a good sign. Um, if we, if the um, infrared laser, the pulse infrared laser wasn't used, if we didn't add extra energy in, um, no deuterated water was detected, but but deuterium molecules, like uh, or I should say ion. Um, Deuterium, deuterium molecular ions were detected. And so what that means is that um, the silicates can, can store implanted deuterium. And so similarly, they, they should be able to store implanted hydrogen. Um, when we added the pulse laser in, what we found was that um, if you look at these, let's see, let me start on the left. If you look at these traces, um, the red trace corresponds to mass to charge ratio of 20. Um, which is the deuterium, um, the deuterated water, the heavy water, D2O plus. Um, and then I'm not going to go through, yeah, I'm not going to talk about this much, but we basically also demonstrated that mass to charge ratio of 20 was not, act, was not corresponding to H2O16, um, um, excuse me, Yeah, not, I'm sorry, not corresponding to H2O18, <laughs> but, but to D2O16. Um, and then also that um, it wasn't doubly, um, doubly ionized argon. Um, so at the low temperature with the, um, with the added energy of the pulse laser, we get this increase in this deuterated water signal. Um, and then also an increase in um, the, the D2 ion as well, the blue, the blue um, trace. And then um, at the higher temperatures, we also see still some additional um, deuterated water coming off and um, deuterium being released. And this, there was a couple of cycles here in which we're still seeing some signal. So with added energy, we're actually seeing deuterated water coming off the sample. So there's, it's still not clear whether the, the D2O is forming directly or whether there's a, um, a, a DO precursor, so an, an analog, a deuterated analog to hydroxyl that's being formed before um, DO2 gets released. We don't really know that from this data. All right, so we, we went ahead and looked at the samples after this whole process. So after it being irradiated and smacked with a laser and then heated up, um, and what we see on the surface, the upper left image is an SEM image from the surface, is, um, is a bunch of popped vesicles. <laughs> and this one still has a lid attached to it. So the, the deuterated water gas generated is got, the pressure got so high, it basically popped pop the lid off the top. And we did a, we took a fib section across one of these. Um, the, the two top layers are platinum that's added on the surface um, in the process of making the, the focused ion beam thin section. And then here, and there's also a layer of carbon that's the, the darkest uh, layer on the surface here. And then below that is the this amorphized region. So amorphized by the, by the, um, the ion beam. And this is one of these, these pits. And then under that is crystalline olivine. Um, so what we found when we did um, electron energy loss spectroscopy is that even after all of this, we're still seeing this eight and a half EV um, energy gap feature in the, the post-process post sample. And um, again, this is the same feature that shows up in our water standards. And also in this case, we use the mineral brucite, which is also full of OH. 
So there's, there's still some either bound or unbound water present in the sample. And so we revised our conclusions here um, to say that, um, yes, solar wind protons generate water or its precursors in silicates. And then we, we can drive that water out to the surface um, by thermal shocks. Okay, so finally, I wanna talk a little bit about some of these asteroid regolith um, uh, sample returns um, coming to us now. And um, the first one I'm gonna talk about is um, a mission by the Japanese, the J Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, JAXA. They send a mission called Hayabusa to an asteroid named Itokawa and collected regolith that was returned to Earth in um, in 2010, so about a decade ago. And um, the, some of the well, the the, the biggest uh, first result that came out was that um, we could now uh, make this direct connection between what's observed with a telescope, um, like observing an asteroid with a telescope, and what we can see from chunks of asteroids that come and fall to Earth as meteorites with microscopes. So this was the 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 ability to connect the S-type asteroids that we can see with spectroscopy and telescopes with what are called the LL chondrites, or these meteorites that we um, sometimes get um, here on Earth. So that's really great. Um, and then we went on to do um, some, some studies to try to understand space weathering in these samples as well. And fortunately, um, this paper just came out two days ago, and so I'm allowed to talk about it, which is great. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of maybe trying to cram a little too much into this uh, colloquium, but I, I wanted to tell you about this. This um, is a nature astronomy paper. Um, the lead author is Luke Daly, um, and, and the title is Solar Wind Contributions to Earth's Ocean. So this is just out now. And um, what we did here was to uh, correlate TEM and atom probe tomography on Itokawa olivine. So um, I'll just... Uh, try to give you a, the brief rundown, but um, this is um, an SEM image of the particle that was um, looked at. One, this is one side of it, and then this is the back side of it. And the red bar shows where a, a thin section was extracted by focused ion beam. Uh, so a FIP section was pulled out for, for transmission electron microscopy. And then uh, just above that, another thin section was pulled out and used to make um, very sharp needles for atom probe tomography. Um, and then on the backside, another location was, was um, uh, sampled for atom probe tomography as well. So the TEM shows that there's a space weathered rim, it's amorphized, uh, it's about 40, 50 nanometers thick. And um, uh, this was actually an iron, a map of iron distribution to show that we weren't seeing um, development of iron nanoparticles, but that's maybe more detail than we need. So um, the atom probe tomography, is I will say it's I'm not an atom probe tomography expert, so I'll explain it as I understand it. But you basically uh, take your sample, uh, take a cross section from the sample, and then you generate really sharp needles from from that cross section. You cut it into to um, uh, essentially cylinders and then make them super sharp. And then that very sharp tip goes um, into well, gets um, put at a very high voltage. Um, such that it's pretty easy to pull atoms or molecules off that, that tip. Um, and then in this case, an ultraviolet laser was used to just give a little bit of an extra energy um, kick to be able to pull off atoms or molecules one or two at a time. Those uh, come off as ions, and then those ions get um, projected onto a position sensitive detector. And that detector gives you, simultaneously gives you the time of flight that it took for that um, molecule or atom to get there, and also the XY position that it lands on. And so the time of flight, of course, can give you the mass to charge ratio for the species. And then with that and the XY position, you can reconstruct where things were in the original needle. So you can get a three-dimensional reconstruction of, the, of what was actually in the sample. Um, so it's a super cool technique, um, very powerful. And um, so what we saw was, uh, let me start over here on the right-hand side. I can get my little cursor. Um, so this kind of teal color is the projection of that 3D reconstruction um, <clears throat> into two dimensions for OH or hydroxyl. Gray on the tip here is um, where the chromium was. So chromium was used as a, as a capping layer on the top of the sample. 
And you can see right away that there's, um, visually it looks like there's um, a higher concentration of, of hydroxyl in this surface layer. So this is the top of the sample. And then to the right is the going into the bulk of this olivine crystal. <clears throat> the little red dashed line is at the interface between the chromium capping layer and the space weathered rim on this olivine. And then the black dashed line is the, the boundary between the space weathered rim and the underlying crystalline olivine that hasn't, hasn't been damaged by, by um, solar wind. And then on the bottom here is um, the same kind of a 2D projection of the, of the, um, the 3D atom probe tomography reconstruction for H2O, so for free water. And again, you see this increase in concentration. And so um, from this, um, a cylindrical region is, is taken out and integrated to give a, a plot of concentration as a function of depth. And um, again, you have this enrichment in hydroxyl and in H2O. And this was observed in, in four different um, samples uh, from, this, uh, from this olivine. The maximum water content in the space weathered rim was 1.6 mole percent, and then the average was about 0.8 percent. And um, this is again, this is great, but uh, of course, any sample that's exposed to ion irradiation is very sensitive to taking up water. And so, right away, um, we needed to confirm that what we were seeing was not terrestrial water, but was actually indigenous to the to the asteroid. And so that means standards. And so. Um, Let's see. And so um, we uh, looked at um, actually three different standards. So one is pristine olivine, um, mineral standard of San Carlos olivine. One is, uh, was helium ion irradiated um, olivine. And then the third was irradiated with deuterium, as I, like I just showed, um, as a, a way to look at the isotopically um, distinct um, proton, right, so the deuteron, um, to see, see what we see there. And what we observed was that there was no enrichment in, um, in hydroxyl or water in either the pristine or the helium ion irradiated standards. The deuterium irradiated um, standard, um, though, shows enrichment in, um, in OD or DO, which is the, um, the deuterated hydroxyl, right, um, in deuterium, and then also in um, deuterated water. Um, but the, the um, H2O and OH didn't we, didn't, we didn't see H2O or OH enrichments. And, and so, and the, these samples were um, processed in the same way as the, the Izokawa sample was. And so we can, we can happily conclude that uh, as we observed in comet dust, um, we also have generation of water from solar wind protons in our, in our asteroid mineral surfaces. Um, so, the water enrichment in the Itokawa rims is consistent with, um, with in, in terms of quantities, consistent with what we, we saw in cometary dust in, in our earlier 2014 paper. But the great thing about the atom probe tomography is that um, because it's much more quantitative, we can start making some estimates. Um, so based on the water enrichment that was observed in the Itokawa rims and the, the thicknesses of those rims and an, an idea of how um, particle sizes are distributed, um, we can estimate that the Itokawa regolith contains about 20 liters per cubic meter of solar wind generated with water. So it's quite a lot of water, um, which is great news um, since um, it would mean potential water resources for um, human space exploration, um, rather than having to carry all water with, um, with us when we travel off the planet's surface. Um, it's, it's possibly the case that water could actually be extracted for you know, for human consumption and also potentially for use as, um, as fuel. The other um, really interesting um, implication here has to do with um, the origin of Earth's water. So current um, models of Earth's formation add water after the planet, has, after the planet's initial accretion. <clears throat> and the, that addition of water is thought to have occurred primarily during the um, the late heavy bombardment um, by water rich uh, small bodies. Um, and when we look at um, uh, compositions, the water rich C type asteroids are the closest match to what we see on Earth. But in fact, Earth's mantle and um, standard mean ocean water are lighter. Let's see if I can get this to pop up. Yeah. Um, so we, we, we're missing an isotopically light component in. To, to match um, Earth's oceans. 
and solar wind um, happily is isotopically light relative to to Earth's oceans and and Earth. <clears throat> and so, what may be happening is that solar wind generated water might might be acting as that missing isotopically light component. If we um, mix water rich C type chondrites and solar wind generated water and create basically create a mixing model between those two. Um, and I, I, in this case, the average of the C-type chondrites was used. You end up finding that some a range somewhere between about 50 and 75% of the mass of water coming from solar generated wind can reproduce the Earth's D to H ratio. So this is pretty uh, remarkable to think about. Um, again, these are, these are kind of estimates, they're, they're, they're from models, not necessarily um, fixed in stone. But if this is the case, then when you, when you take a drink of water, about half of that might actually have been derived from the sun and rock, right, sun and rock. So there are um, two other um, asteroid sample return missions I wanted to mention. One is um, the Hayabusa 2 mission, also a JAXA mission uh, to a, a carbonaceous type asteroid. This came back to Earth um, last year, and it's currently in our labs. We're, we're studying it. The initial manuscripts are in preparation, and so I cannot say anything. My lips are sealed, <laughs> but um, you should be looking for those results to come out, I think, early in the, in the coming year. And then there's an, uh, also a mission, a NASA mission called OSIRIS-REx um, that is um, visiting an asteroid called Bennu and is coming back in another couple of years. And so again, stay tuned, there's gonna be a lot more really, in, really interesting results coming from these, um, these sample return missions from asteroids. Okay, I'm running really, really um, behind on time. So I wanted to spend just uh, the last um, couple minutes talking about the broader implications for this generation of water by solar wind or stellar winds um, even beyond Earth. Um, and so the first thing to think about is that anywhere there's a star that's generating protons that are hitting, that's hitting rock surfaces, you're forming radiolytic water, you're, you're creating water um, from the oxygen. And so this is a universal process, um, like truly universal in the sense that it's happening across the universe. The second thing is that if you'll remember back at the beginning of the talk, I was showing you how comet dust has this intimate mix between organic material and rocky material, and asteroids also contain a lot of organics. So when you're having this radiolytic water being created by solar wind or stellar wind, um, it's, it's in the presence of organics. And so you're simultaneously delivering water and organics in close proximity to each other. Um, the Earth is currently accreting an estimated 20 to 40,000 tons of interplanetary dust each year. So it's still, we're still growing. Um, the, the fluxes of that dust um, were actually higher earlier in the Earth's history. So there's a lot of material that, that gets delivered to the, to the Earth's surface. And um, once uh, the Earth developed an atmosphere um, or another planet develops an atmosphere, then that passage through the atmosphere is actually injecting thermal energy into the particle. And so as, I, as we showed in um, the Jouet all paper, that's releasing water, the driving water out of the rock and making it uh, more available. And um, so of course you're also injecting thermal energy into the organics. And so you can think of, of dust entering the, the earth's atmosphere or another planet's atmosphere as these kind of micron scale chemical reactors that are accreting to the, the surface of the earth and other terrestrial planets. And this um, would of course be happening elsewhere as well. So it's kind of fun to think about this constant global rain of organics and water. Um, these are, of course, the starting materials for life as we know it here on Earth. And you can consider it like planting a whole lot of seeds. And of course, you only need a few of them to sprout. And even if um, your early sprouts um, die off, as I do not have a green thumb, so <laughs> I have experience with this. So even if your early sprouts die off, you still are continuing to plant seeds. And so you, you're going to get some more sprouts later. Okay, I think I'm really um, running and I, I wanna leave some time for some questions. So I'm gonna skip that and just stop here and, and say thank you. Um, and then I have some funding acknowledgements at the bottom, but I'm happy to take any questions from, from the audience. <laughs> 